Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing concerning the investigations into the Department of Housing and Urban Development. The hearing took place here in Washington on Wednesday. A former top assistant to former HUD Secretary Samuel Pierce refused to testify before the congressional panel, citing his Fifth Amendment rights. Lance Wilson, formerly Pierce's executive assistant, appeared under subpoena but refused to answer questions. Representative Tom Lantos, a Democrat from California, chairs the subcommittee. Subcommittee on Employment and Housing will please come to order. At today's hearing on the scandals at HUD, our witnesses will be Mr. Lance Wilson, former executive assistant to HUD Secretary Pierce, from March 1981 to June 1984, who will be appearing before the subcommittee under subpoena. Mr. Donald Meron, chief executive officer of Payne Weber. Mr. Alexander Neclerio, former director of housing at the New York regional office of HUD. Mr. Dick Udaly, former regional administrator at the Fort Worth office of HUD, and Mr. Walter Severe, Deputy Regional Administrator at HUD's Fort Worth, uh, Fort Worth office. Secretary Pierce, a hands-off manager, referred to Lance Wilson as his right hand. Mr. Wilson was the person responsible for hiring Deborah Dean and for recommending that she succeed him as executive assistant to the secretary. After leaving HUD, Mr. Wilson made millions of dollars from HUD-related projects. He was bullish on HUD, with good reason. When Lance Wilson spoke, HUD not only listened, it apparently acted. After leaving HUD, Mr. Wilson became part of the Wynn Group, a team of HUD alumni which cashed in so spectacularly on the moderate rehabilitation program. The Wynn Group consisted, among others, of Philip Wynn, former HUD Assistant Secretary for Housing and recent U.S. Ambassador to Switzerland, Philip Abrams, former Under Secretary of HUD, J. Michael Keenan, former HUD official in the Denver office, and Lance Wilson. At a time when MUD rehab funds were so scarce and units so much in demand, in the seven projects that we are aware of, the Wynn Group received 1,347 units at a cost to the taxpayers of more than $133 million in subsidies and $29 million in tax credits. Based on his share of the proceeds from the sale of the tax credits on four of these Wind Group mod rehab projects, it is estimated that Mr. Wilson received more than $2 million. Mr. Wilson also received consulting fees on several mud rehab projects in North Dakota. On December 17, 1985, Christmas came early for Mr. Wilson when he was given a 15% interest in the $24 million Riviera Beach project by developer Leonard Briscoe. Two years earlier, while at HUD, Mr. Wilson had a key role in supporting a $7 million Urban Development Action Grant application for the Regal Ridge Project in Fort Worth, Texas that was being pushed by Mr. Briscoe. The Regal Ridge Project was awarded funds over the strongest objections of the HUD Regional Office Career Staff who viewed the project as ill-conceived, ill-designed, and undercapitalized. 
We will be hearing testimony this morning from the former HUD regional administrator in Fort Worth that at a meeting on this project, Wilson told him, quote, your regional recommendation of disapproval is making it very difficult to bring it to fruition, end quote. You will also hear testimony about Mr. Wilson doing outside consulting work while employed full-time at Payne Webber. For example, in early 1988, when HUD Deputy Assistant Secretary Hunter Cushing raised some objections to approving FHA mortgage insurance for the Ritz Towers project in New York City, Mr. Wilson was paid $10,000 to get Cushing to stop interfering with the project. In 1988, <clears throat> Mr. Wilson's salary and bonuses at Payne Webber totaled $325,000. While working as a first vice president of Payne Webber, Mr. Wilson appears to have been Payne Webber's ambassador to HUD. Mr. Wilson's expense accounts, which many diplomats would envy, is replete with hosting lunches, dinners, and receptions for HUD employees. During the period from April 1986 through this spring, Mr. Wilson spent more than $10,000 of Payne Webber's money whining and dining HUD officials. This included paying over $1,000 for a dinner party given by Deborah Dean in July 1986, a $235 dinner with Miss Dean in December 86, and the $114 lunch with her in March 1988. In May 1988, when Mr. Wilson was, pay, was being paid $10,000 as a private consultant, quote, to take care of Hunter Cushing, end quote. Mr. Wilson treated Mr. Cushing to a $171 dinner. Tom Demery and his wife were beneficiaries of a $235 dinner in April 1987, while Jim Hammernick, HUD director of multifamily housing and a guest, joined Mr. Wilson and his wife in February 87 for a $421 dinner. Mr. Wilson's expense account at Payne Webber included such notable items as $368.10 to rent a limousine to take Phil Wynn, Michael Keenan, and Mr. Wilson from the Grand Hotel to attend the President's dinner. $259 was paid to repair a woman's ring, which was damaged, quote, while bowling at Phil's client party, end quote. And the $129 and $129 for DC Councilman H.R. Crawford's new office for a potted plant. An examination of Mr. Wilson's telephone records at Payne Webber for a six month period showed that over 10% of his phone calls were to HUD, with many of those calls to Secretary Pierce's office. Documents from HUD files suggest that Mr. Wilson enjoyed unparalleled access to Secretary Pierce. While Mr. Wilson made millions of dollars after leaving HUD, the question is, did it result from what he knew or whom he knew? Were the projects that he was involved in funded by HUD based on their unique merits, or did they result from connections at HUD? Did Mr. Wilson make his money the old-fashioned way? by earning it. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, along with other members of the subcommittee, am fully expecting Mr. Wilson to exercise his right today against self-incrimination by taking the fifth. Presumably the fifth is used as a shield to protect the innocent. The purpose of the subcommittee today is to continue to fer out, ferret out fraud, waste, mismanagement, and abuse and goodness knows we have our hands full of that. Only by fully examining the actions of these responsible individuals can this body best determine if possible conflict of interest occurred. After leaving HUD, Mr. Wilson was given, as the chairman mentioned, a 15% equity by Leonard Briscoe in a Florida UDAG grant, people's money, called River Riviera Beach ostensibly for legal and financial advice that he provided. 
Mr. Wilson's equity share has been estimated today to be worth approximately $3.6 million. Now, I know his services were probably very valuable, his experience extremely critical, but that is a powerful price tag. While serving as ex executive assistant to Secretary Pierce, Mr. Wilson supported an application for Mr. Briscoe for the UDAG funding for a Fort Worth, Texas project called Regal Ridge over the objections of virtually every HUD career staff member. Although Mr. Wilson stated to this subcommittee under oath that he had no role in program selections, it is important for us to proceed diligently in determining the situation surrounding these compensations to him after he left HUD and their relationship to decisions that he helped make while at HUD. Deborah Gordine single-handedly brought the wheels of a large and complex federal agency virtually to a screeching halt. Mr. Wilson recommended Deborah Gordine his, as his successor to Secretary Pierce for the position of executive assistant to the secretary, where she did this damage by her, the power of her position and the positioning of her title and authority. While this body's been looking at the situations of influence peddling in the awarding of moderate housing rehabilitation projects at HUD, we have not yet really scratched the surface. Former regional administrator for HUD Chicago Regional Office, Ron Gatham, was interviewed by HUD's Office Inspector General regarding consulting fees he received for lobbying HUD on behalf of developers applying for mod rehab funds. I would like to ask the chairman and members of the committee to consider expanding these hearings to allow this subcommittee to fully investigate the instance of influence peddling throughout the country in virtually every major program involving billions of dollars in HUD money. I want to thank the gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I'd like to say, uh, from my experience as a member of the Housing Subcommittee, there have been some HUD programs, community development block grants, for instance, um, many of the public housing programs where influence peddling has not been a significant factor. And uh, I want us to be very clear that we don't condemn the important positive efforts of HUD because of the abuses of a few. I would also add, apparently, we've been told that Mr. Wilson, like Mr. Pierce, is going to invoke the privilege against self-incrimination. We've had several people do that in these hearings, uh, Secretary Pierce, uh, Ms. Dean, Mr. Wilson, um, Mr. Cushing. People have accompanied their invocation of the Fifth Amendment with a variety of other explanations at various times. People have said, well, they didn't have enough time. Uh, they hadn't had a chance to talk with their lawyers. They didn't have enough documents. Uh, looking at Mr. Pierce's Freedom of Information request, which he sent to HUD, which he said he needed to testify, uh, there aren't enough documents in the world to meet that kind of request. People have an absolute right under our constitutional system, and I think most of us support that, to invoke the self-incrimination clause as a reason for not testifying. Anything they add to that, it ought to be clear is not an essential part of the invocation of the privilege. And in every case that I've heard here, the reasons people have given for invoking the Fifth Amendment have seemed to me to be made up, inaccurate. No one has been forced to come before the subcommittee with inadequate time to prepare, with inadequate time to talk to a lawyer, with inadequate time to look at documents. My recollection is that anybody who's asked for a specific period of time or an approximate period of time to review documents has been given it. So those who are invoking self-incrimination, which they have a right to do, are doing so presumably because during their administration of public business and public money and their involvement with public money after the fact, uh, as a private seeker of public money, they have reason to think that there may have been criminal activity. And people have an absolute right to invoke that constitutional privilege. But I think we ought to be clear that the uh, efforts to soften it that we've gotten that it was a matter of time, that they couldn't talk to the lawyer, they didn't have the documents, that those are in fact not accurate. And that we have people who are unwilling to discuss the actions they took with public money because to do so would be damaging to them. That 
is why this subcommittee has to uh, continue. I also note, and uh, we've got a number of conflicting things going on this morning. I'm pleased, Mr. Chairman, that you've invited, among others, uh, Mr. Neclerio. I know he's not in good health, and I just want to say I appreciate his willingness to come and testify. And specifically, he's not under any kind of suspicion as far as I'm concerned. But when Mr. Monticello spoke, several of the more controversial decisions that came up, Mr. Monticello said Mr. Neclerio had made those decisions. And it seemed only reasonable that Mr. Neclerio be given a chance to, uh, to comment on that. And that's, uh, he's not here, as I said, suspected of anything uh, untoward. His record appears to be a good one. It did seem to me important for us to try and unravel what's happening here for him to be able to comment on those uh, assertions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And let me just uh, reconfirm what uh, my colleague from Massachusetts has said. We have invited Mr. Neclerio to give him an opportunity uh, to set the record straight. And, and there is no indication of any kind uh, that there is any wrongdoing on his part whatsoever. Congressman Shays. Uh, Congressman Martinez. Congressman Wise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, simply to note that uh, Mr. Wilson appears to be the prime or the worst example of the political favoritism and influence peddling that characterized the administration of the Department of Housing and Urban Development under Mr. Pierce. Congressman Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just comment uh, twofold. One, uh, apparently we once again are going to um, uh, hear the assertion of uh, uh, the Fifth Amendment privilege. Um, I think this underscores, as, uh, as many other actions of, uh, uh, have been revealed in, this, uh, uh, in these proceedings, uh, that there are uh, sets of circumstances that, uh, that definitely suggest uh, criminal conduct. And while, uh, since we are not getting answers from many of the players, uh, we cannot determine uh, precisely who uh, was engaged in this conduct, I think this uh, underscores and reinforces uh, the need for the Justice Department uh, to, to view this not just as um, a case of uh, mismanagement and uh, mistaken judgment at the highest levels in HUD, uh, but uh, an instance in which uh, white-collar crime uh, may well have occurred, and uh, ultimately a grand jury uh, needs uh, to, to look at these matters with uh, the full investigative powers of the Justice Department and uh, the full power uh, uh, to um, uh, elicit uh, information and evidence uh, with respect to these individuals. Secondly, I'd like to comment and join um, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Frank, in, in uh, thanking you for um, uh, bringing Mr. Neclerio here. Uh, it did seem to me that when Mr. Monticello was here and was asked questions about political influence in his decisions or inappropriate uh, association of uh, the uh, regional office in New York with various fundraising activities, uh, that every time um, it got a little hot for Mr. Monticello, he said, oh, that was Mr. Neclerio. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, that it's very important that Mr. Neclerio be here and be able to respond to that. Uh, and uh, those uh, concerns, which I think were very legitimate concerns about whether um, uh, political influence was involved in decisions in the New York office, very important that we know uh, ultimately who it was that was making those political decisions and who was influencing them. So I uh, also look forward to Mr. Neclerio's testimony on that point. Thank you very much, Congressman Kyle. Congressman Schumer. Thank you very much. I just would like to, to make a comment concerning the remarks of our colleague from Massachusetts, with which I'm in full accord. Um, claiming the Fifth Amendment is a very important privilege that every American citizen has. But that claim relates to potential self-incrimination. I think it's extremely important to underscore, as my colleague from Massachusetts so ably did, that all the subsidiary arguments are non-relevant to the claim of the Fifth Amendment. We have heard comments, for instance, that the subcommittee has prejudged various matters. I think it's important to distinguish between two kinds of judgments. 
various members of the subcommittee have come to their own conclusions, as has the chairman, with respect to, for instance, the performance of Mr. Pierce as secretary of HUD. We haven't prejudged his performance, we have judged his performance. We have judged his performance on the basis of an eight-year record and a five months investigation, 17 hearings. The judgment of the chair is clear. He was a miserable secretary of HUD. It is not difficult to judge the performance of a football team that loses 100 consecutive games. At the end of the 100 games, you don't prejudge their performance, you judge their performance. Now, there is a question of criminal culpability on which certainly no judgments have been made. The fact that a football team loses 100 consecutive games does not prove or disprove that members of that team use steroids. That's another question. We have made no judgments concerning those. So I think it's important to, to underscore that um, uh, members of the subcommittee, on the basis of their very intensive involvement with HUD over a protracted period, are fully capable of judging and are fully entitled to judging the job performance of various HUD officials. The record of HUD is clear. It's there for all to see, and all of us can make our judgments concerning that. Nor should we be apologetic about making those judgments. There are some who feel that Mr. Pierce's stewardship was exemplary. They are entitled to that judgment. That doesn't happen to be the judgment, apparently, of Secretary Kemp or several members of the subcommittee who have spoken on this subject. But I think the subcommittee members uh, uh, have been meticulously careful in not judging uh, questions of culpability uh, on, on the part of, uh, of witnesses. The chairman is in receipt of a communication from the attorney to Mr. Wilson uh, invoking Rule 11.3.F2. Uh, the chairman will now read that rule and subsequently will ask television, radio, and still photographers to cease their functioning. They're welcome to remain, of course, in the, in the hearing room to uh, witness the proceedings. Uh, the rule is as follows. No witness served with a subpoena by the committee shall be required against his or her will to be photographed at any hearing or to give evidence or testimony while the broadcasting of that hearing by radio or television is being conducted. At the request of any such witness who does not wish to be subjected to radio, television, or still photography coverage, all lenses shall be covered and all microphones used for coverage turned off. This subparagraph is supplementary to clause 2K5 of this rule relating to the protection of the rights of witnesses. Uh, the chair would like to request television, radio, and still photography coverage to cease. Our next witness is Mr. Alexander Niclerio, former director of housing for the New York office of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. I'd like to ask Mr. Niclerio to come up to the witness uh, table. Uh, please be seated. Uh, we will. Um, swear you in in just a minute. Um, we will close the door um, and uh, <coughs> before I will uh, swear in the next witness, uh, like to make a couple of observations. We had uh, a remarkable but brief seminar on the proper uses of the Fifth Amendment. And uh, I'm grateful to all of my colleagues who have contributed to our understanding of this 
um, because I think it's an it's a invaluable and precious privilege uh, that all American citizens have. Uh, in view of the fact that uh, the witness today, Mr. Wilson, and the witness yesterday, Mr. Pierce, uh, argued in part that they are claiming the Fifth Amendment for a whole variety of reasons, the Chair would merely like to state the obvious. Uh, the Fifth Amendment can be properly invoked only if there is a legitimate, a genuine fear of self-incrimination. That is the only reason that a witness can claim for taking the Fifth Amendment. All other arguments are either redundant or designed to confuse uh, the issue. Uh, we have had that now on two occasions, and uh, uh, I think it was useful to uh, have the dialogue within within the subcommittee. Congressman Schumer. I just want to underscore what you have said. I mean, we've had now four witnesses take the Fifth Amendment. There's almost a uh, conspiracy of silence, and that is the witnesses' right. But to do what some of them have done, which is uh, try to say it was the committee's fault and that's why they took a fi the Fifth Amendment is misstating and perverting what the Fifth Amendment is all about. It's their constitutional right to take it on the grounds they may incriminate themselves, not on the grounds they can't testify when they want to, that questions might be asked that they wouldn't like to hear. Uh, what we're trying to do on this committee under your leadership, Mr. Chairman, is bring some sunlight to the process, and that is to find out what went wrong at HUD so it might be avoided in the future. We're not a prosecuting body, nor intend to. We're doing our job to see that the, whatever billions of dollars are left in the housing budget be spent appropriately and going to the people who need help. And if the witnesses, for their reasons, can't help us in that, so be it. But to blame you or any other member of this committee uh, for doing what is really our job, I think, is just turning things totally on their head. Thank you very much. Any other comment? Uh, Ms. Nicleria, may I ask you to stand, please? Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please be seated. <coughs> Mr. Nicleria, you may care to identify your counsel before we begin. My attorney to my right is Raymond Gruenwald. We are pleased to have you, sir. Sir. Uh, for the record, the Chair wishes to state that uh, Mr. McClary, of course, is appearing on a voluntary basis. We appreciate your appearance. You may proceed with any opening statement you might have, and then members of the committee will have questions to ask of you, sir. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Lantos, members of the subcommittee, my name is Alexander McClario. I am here today pursuant to your request and hopefully will assist you in clarifying certain aspects of your inquiry. <clears throat> By way of general background, I would like to advise you of certain facts that you might gain a better picture of me as a human being. I am a resident of the city of White Plains, New York, and have been for the past 33 years. I was born in Brooklyn, New York City, 67 years ago. I was one of eight children. You don't look it, Mr. Niclerio, but, <laughs> but since, you are under, since you are under oath, we accept the statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I was one of eight children born of immigrant parents. Although a product of very humble beginnings, growing up in an area surrounded by factories and a freight yard in a slum area of East New York, Brooklyn, I and my family did the best we could to realize the American dream. Much of it in various aspects of public service. I graduated from Frank and K. Lane High School in Brooklyn in 1940. And while holding a part-time job with a fruit and vegetable store six days a week, attended Manhattan College in New York for two years 
when my studies were interrupted by World War II. Drafted into the United States Army in February of 1943, I served as a member of the 29th Infantry Division, the Yankee Division, in a European theater. I was wounded in combat in the early fighting of what became known as the Battle of the Bulge in the Metz Assas Lorraine sector. And when our position were overrun by Nazi Tiger tanks and our company decimated, I and about 40 others were taken prisoner. I spent approximately one year as a prisoner of war in Germany. I am a recipient of military decorations, including the Purple Heart and a Prisoner of War Medal. My military service to our nation ended in December of 1945. Among many other souvenirs of service, I was discharged with very few of my own teeth and a heart defect. I am officially a disabled war veteran. After taking the necessary civil service examinations, seeking a position with the United States government, I was placed with the Veterans Administration at a grade two level, which paid $1,750 per year in 1946. In the early part of 1947, I transferred to the Federal Housing Administration as a clerk, grade two, the lowest starting grade. My duties were assistant to the stockroom clerk. During the years of 1948 and 49, I attended night classes at Columbia University, taking real estate courses in an effort to improve my qualifications for higher responsibilities. From 1947 to 1954, I received a normal salary increases yearly and performed various duties, mainly as an administrative assistant to the director of the FHA insuring office. In 1955, I became project procedure representative at a grade 11 on the administrative staff. The duties, as per the, as per the job description, were to provide contact and liaison work, as well as advisory services to mortgagees, builders, sponsors, and all other interested parties relating to FHA mortgage insurance programs. From 1958 to 1961, I was a supervisory insurance program representative at a grade 12. The duties were basically the same with the added responsibilities of supervising a staff of representatives due to the increased volume of applications and construction activity. Also in 1961, or may I say in 1961, I became the special assistant to the director at a grade 13. Then later in 61, I became the deputy director in the New York uh, area office at a grade 15 and was then second in command in the entire New York office. And I continued in that capacity until 1967. Now FHA at that time had become a part of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, better known as HUD. In 1967, I became the deputy assistant regional administrator for housing under S. William Green now Congress, Congressman Bill Green. I continued in that position until 1970. In 1970, as a result of political interests, I was reduced from Deputy Assistant Regional Administrator to the position of Production Coordinator on a staff of Deputy Assistant Regional Administrator for Housing. The Regional Administrator chose to appoint the former mayor of Rivervale, New Jersey, Walter Johnson, a Republican who worked with John Ehrlichman of the Nixon presidential team fame to replace me. Mr. Johnson, after several years, was appointed area manager in the Newark, New Jersey area office. As a result, I became the acting assistant regional administrator for about one year until regional administrator Bill Green recommended another person for the assistant regional administrator's position. Concurrence in his recommendation was denied in Washington since Mr. Green's applicant did not have housing experience. Whereas the Assistant Secretary of Housing, FHA Commissioner, and members of his staff, let it be known 
that they believed that I was the best qualified for this position. Mr. Green then recommended another person, and Washington denied his request again, and for the same reasons. Regional Administrator Green appealed to the assistant to the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and ultimately his applicant was approved and appointed around 1975. In 1977, there was a change of administration. I was on the best qualified list for the position of area manager, New York area office of HUD. Rumors had it that Alan Weiner, an assistant to the mayor of New York City, was to receive the appointment. I can recall vividly being interviewed by the then Secretary of Housing, Patricia Harris, and was very much encouraged by her remarks as they referred to my qualifications and experience, and was told that no decision had been made. Immediately after leaving her office, I went to the office of the Assistant Secretary of Housing, FHA Commissioner, and Larry Simons told me that Alan Weiner was going to be the area manager, and that I would become director of housing and that we would make a good team. It was all cut and dried. A short time later, Mr. Alan Weiner, who by the way was a most capable man, was appointed area manager of the New York area office. At this point, in 1977, Mr. Joseph Monticello was reassigned from his position as area manager in New York area office to a comparatively minor position in the New York regional office. I was then officially asked by the newly appointed area manager, Alan Weiner, to become his director of housing in the New York area office. After some thought, I accepted, on the condition that four or five persons had to be moved from their position since I felt that they were just not qualified and had been placed by the previous administration for purely political reasons. I was appointed in 1977 Director of Housing, New York Area. The unblemished record for the office during this period speaks for itself as to the excellent quality and a high volume of housing produced. In 1981, with another change of administration, I was again on the best qualified list, Area Manager, New York Area Office. I was advised by the then Administrative Office in Washington, D.C that I needed political clearance. I contacted three people in Republican Party politics that I knew. The Westchester Republican leader, Anthony Colavita, the Bronx Republican leader, John Calandra, and the Brooklyn leader, who was also the New York State Chairman, George Clark. All were very receptive in recommending me for that position. Mr. Niclerio, I don't want to rush you, but we have three other witnesses. Can you try to wrap up your prepared statement so we move on? We, well, I would we like could to move on to your questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to show here that uh, it was apparent that the uh, newly appointed Secretary of Housing, Samuel R. Pierce, had his feelings about who should be uh, the area manager, and he selected a person who was a friend of his, Edwin Davis, a longtime friend who played football with Pierce or Pierce's brother. Uh, and at this point, and I'm trying to uh, can make this more concise, at this point, Mr. Davis became area manager and Mr. Joseph Monticello became regional administrator. Now, I found myself working as director of housing in the New York office under very difficult condition. I had had little or no contact with Mr. Monticello until he suddenly became my boss. Now, Mr. Davis was my immediate superior and always acted in an antagonistic relationship with me, uh, feeling that I did something wrong because I sought a position I felt I was best qualified for. In 1981, I suffered a heart attack, my first one. In 1983, the offices merged, and this was another trying period because all positions were available. And uh, after Secretary Pierce was pushing for Davis and Senator Aldamato clamoring for Mr. Monticello, uh, when everything worked out, Mr. Monticello was regional administrator. Ed Davis was deputy, had the number two slot. And they sent me a job description stating I was acting director of housing. They didn't know if they should make me director. I had to prove myself. Uh, shortly afterwards, in 1983, I underwent cardiac catheterization at Mount Sinai Hospital. 
Approximately a year later, I was appointed director of housing. Now, since my retirement, uh, I retired April 11th, 1986, after 43 years of government service. Since my retirement, I opened an office in White Plains, New York, in a partnership arrangement. My two partners are my two sons. Uh, we do a variety of things. We build small professional buildings. One we own and manage. Another one is being built as a condominium. By the way, none of these are HUD related. We also seek land for improvement. The partnership represents three firms who did business with HUD previously, two of which do not participate in any subsidized programs whatsoever. And the, the one that do, the partnership does represent that deals with subsidized programs, our participation is only with the management aspects and do not involve ourselves with funding proposals for new proposals, rehabilitation, or mod rehab. Uh, because of time, I will skip the awards and, and the uh, many things I did under the trying times in New York City. They will be, they will be part of the record, your entire statement. Thank you very statement. much, Mr. Chairman. Well, we thank you very much, and let me just say you deserve a lot of commendation from all of us for uh, both your outstanding military service and for 43 years of uh, distinguished public service under difficult circumstances occasionally. <coughs> After you retired from HUD, uh, Mr. Naclerio, in April of 86, um, you apparently had some business dealings with Mr. Lance Wilson. During the course of those business dealings, uh, you made two payments to him. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yes, I can. Uh, approximately three or four months... Could you pull the mic, both of them, a little closer to you? Approximately... Three or four months after my retirement, I received a phone call from a gentleman from Puerto Rico, and evidently he met me or knew of me and asked me to represent him. And I advised him that I could not because one year had to elapse, and if it were something that I was dealing with previously, I could not deal with it for two years. But he said he only wanted advice and guidance from me, and he was, uh, felt that it would be nothing uh, prohibited me from giving him advice and he asked me some questions and I really didn't know too much what he was talking about. I think he was looking for some kind of funds in Puerto Rico that were earmarked. And I told him that I could not and he insisted and I told him that I would contact someone who would give me information. I called Lance Wilson and I asked him did he know anything about such funds and what could be done and he got back to me and stated that uh, there was the program that he was referring to and uh, I called back the gentleman in Puerto Rico and told him that someone could do it, and I, I would tell him the method of operation. However, I could not go to any office. And uh, evidently it was successful, and he sent me a check for $15,000. I must state Mr. Wilson never asked me for any money. I sent him a check for $5,000. Uh, the second dealing uh, was a project in mid-Manhattan, and for those of you who know Manhattan, the old Mamalione restaurant was purchased by a Jason Carter, the site was, and uh, he proposed a housing complex. And uh, I, it was brought to my attention approximately 11 months after my retirement, and uh, I met Jason Carter, and he told me that he wanted me to represent him. This was something that was never in the office of FHA or HUD and I told him that was nearing the time and he brought up a name of Irving Wharton as a broker representing him and I told him I was I knew Irving Wharton and company very well in fact his uh, chief assistant was my deputy at FHA and HUD and I was uneasy that he wanted me to replace I Wharton and company and he said that uh, he wasn't concerned about wanting. He wanted me because he was told that I was the expert in these housing matters. This was not a subsidized housing. It was merely mortgage insurance. Of it. And I told him if he permitted me to, I would speak to Irving Wharton. And if we could do it as co-brokers, uh, I would be willing. But I would not want to cut Irving Wharton out. With this, he agreed. And I want a company filled out all the applications, filed it, but I made the major decisions and made major changes in a proposed structural plan so that he could realize the legitimate 
maximum mortgage, which we did. Now, as it refers to Lance Wilson, uh, this was a complex proposal because it dealt with mid-Manhattan site, 40, uh, uh, 467 apartments, I believe, and the high rents, air rights, and complex. I must state it requires someone who really knows FHA mortgage insurance and real estate to analyze one of these. And the New York area office did their work and it was sent to Washington for the normal approval under the 240% cost adjustment. There has never been a project in Manhattan that was co constructed without the 240 cost adjustment allowance. When it got to Washington, uh, I was advised that they had a lot of problems because the New York office did not get proper justification or documentation to Washington in support of the mortgage. They asked me to go down to explain it. They asked me to speak to two people on a technical staff, which I did. And they said, just leave the exhibits there and they will analyze it. They called me back the second time to talk about air rights and, and comparable rents, etc., and the complex mortgage insurance. And I went there and I spoke to the people and they were satisfied. I then met Mr. Jim Hamannick, and you must understand all these people that I'm referring to have worked on the technical aspects for many a years, and I respected them all. But Mr. Hamannick told me that I had a problem, that there was a Mr. Hunter Cushing, who I don't think I've ever met, but I certainly was aware of his being there. Yeah. He was appointed politically, and he pushed his weight around. And a reference was made, and uh, let me be careful. He said that effing Guinea from New York, referring to me. Why should I do anything for that effing Guinea from New York? With this, I was really annoyed because I had put over a year of work into this, meetings with the architects and the attorneys, etc. And I must admit, it was a sizable fee. And I was now felt that I was getting the political zing that I was aware of as I worked with HUD, what can be done. And I did what I, the only thing I possibly could do. I called Lance Wilson and I related to him the story and I asked him, I did not want any help in approving the project. I merely wanted the normal process to take place and I volunteered to Mr. Wilson that it was a very important thing to me. It was my first major endeavor, non-subsidized, purely mortgage insurance, and would he get me the reasons why Hunter Cushing was out to hurt me. He got back to me a day or two later and stated that he spoke to Hunter Cushing and that Mr. Cushing would not interfere and if the documentation justified the mortgage, he would not interfere with it. Uh, approximately a few weeks later, the how commitment much, was issued. How much did you pay him for I this? paid him $10,000 in check, mailed to him. Now, do I understand you, Mr. Neclerio, that your project basically was in fine shape from a technical point of view as far as you knew initially? Was, I was director of housing. I worked for HUD for, so you had for no 43 years. No, I definitely have no problem. I must add this, to, sir. I've read newspaper articles and comments. I really don't understand the newspaper articles or the people in HUD who commented. We're talking about a project where the total development cost is $123 million. The mortgage is $84 million. If the cost were $94 million, the same mortgage would be realized because the law states that the mortgage is predicated on a lower of various criteria. One I is understand. cost. I, I don't want to get into all of the details. My question is, is a simple one. You felt you had a worthwhile project, a technically worthwhile project. Not only did I, but I felt the government was making huge sums of money because of the mortgage insurance premium, the application. They realized like a million five hundred thousand the first year and would realize like eight hundred thousand a year for the term of the mortgage on this kind of a project. This is not a subsidized project. It this was it was an above average project. Oh, way above. Way mid, above average. Mid mid but, but you were told that Hunter Cushing might give you trouble with it. Definitely. Yes, I was told. And then you went to Lance Wilson to fix your troubles, anticipated troubles with Hunter Cushing? Well, I think what I called him, I told him, would you like to be co-broker? And I gave him the story 
of what the Hunter Cushing stated. Yes, sir. At this time, what was Mr. Wilson doing? Where, where he, was he employed? He was at Payne Webber, sir. He was already at Payne Webber. Yes, this was, uh, I would say, in 1987, the early part of, the latter part of 87, yes. So he was a vice president of Payne Webber, but he undertook this assignment on his own. Yes. I presume. And you paid well, him? Well, I asked him to, yes. Yes, and you paid him how much? $10,000. Yes, uh, the chair would like to place in the record, uh, without objection, the two checks referred to in Mr. Niclerio's testimony. Um, what, can you recall uh, what exactly Mr. Wilson told you after his meeting with Mr. Cushing? Well, he got back to me and stated that Hunter Cushing denied making any remarks about me and that he really was not trying to hurt me. And uh, I, I, that was the answer he gave me, and that Mr. Cushing stated he would not interfere, and if the technical people uh, made a determination, good or bad, he would just endorse the uh, recommendation from the technical people. Yeah, your understanding is that Mr. Wilson had one meeting in connection with your project with Mr. Cushing? I really cannot answer that. He did not report to me one meeting, phone call, or how many, but well, I know that it was successful. Yeah, how much, how much after you had the initial meeting with Mr. Wilson on this matter did, uh, did he report back to you? Oh, he, he reported back to me uh, a day or two, <coughs> a day or two later. So it's reasonable to assume he may have called Mr. Cushing I, or met with him? I'm sorry, sir. So, I, like I would assume uh, the fact that he got back to me so quickly, that was a phone call. Okay, very good. Um, I only have um, uh, uh, two more questions. With respect to the Grand Bahia project in Puerto Rico, it is my understanding, Mr. Niclerio, that when you were interviewed by subcommittee staff, you told them that uh, you received a phone call from Lance Wilson in 82, he said there were problems with this project in Puerto Rico. It was a project of great importance to Secretary Pierce. Um, and he wanted uh, to, to uh, get this project moving. Can you tell us a little bit about this? I would believe that uh, my statement was that I received a phone call either on a Saturday or Sunday evening and uh, that uh, Lance Wilson made the call to me. To your home? To my home, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And made the phone call stating that he was calling on uh, Secretary Pierce's behalf, that it was important to someone higher up in, in higher circles. Who was that? And they was the name mentioned? Yes, there was. What was the name? The um, name mentioned was that there was a major contributor to the George Bush vice presidential campaign, and uh, that a person by the name of Delio Rojo was the major contributor and that s efforts were made by some technical people in Puerto Rico. Then they sent a Frank Brown, technical person in uh, Washington, and then they sent Ralph Lapidula, who was my deputy there, and uh, with very little results. And I don't know if Mr. Wilson paid me a compliment, but he stated that he thought that it was that important that I should report immediately to Washington. I had been on vacation and that the New York office was aware that uh, I would go to Washington, be briefed, and then go to Puerto Rico to analyze the proposal. I went to Washington and met with the Assistant Secretary of Housing and some staff members, and they briefed me on the proposal. I then left and went to Puerto Rico and I met the area manager and the director of housing in Puerto Rico, and I proceeded to go to the site, and we met Delio Rojo. The structure was a vacant structure, high-rise building, and uh, it was occupied by two swimming pools, a few restaurants, and a gambling casino. And it was, the purpose was uh, Section 8, housing for the elderly. Let me be sure I understand you. Are you testifying that this facility had a gambling casino? 
Yes, sir, I am. Says? That was a vacant. A vac was, previous. Uh, yeah, it was not in use at the time. I understand. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, when I was there, uh, working with many, many proposals, this was certainly unique. And uh, I spoke to the people in Puerto Rico, and then I returned back to Washington, and I told them that uh, it certainly was unique. And I said, the only possible way that it could work that you consider the swimming pools, the casino, and perhaps one of the restaurants, or even both of them, as off-site, not included in the mortgage. However, to have these facilities, when they were in operation, pay rent to the mortgagor, and therefore the subsidized rent, Section 8, annual contribution contract, would be reduced a substantial amount by that method. I wasn't happy about it, but I reported to myself. Why weren't you happy about it? I just don't like to see a housing for the elderly with a casino in it and swimming pools and uh, restaurants all over the place. No, I was not happy, but I worked for the government. I worked for superiors. They were my bosses. Uh, I have suffered ups and downs so many times that I merely answered the questions of my superiors and I told them the only way it could be done if these facilities were considered off-site and they must pay rent, and I'm talking about real rent, to reduce the subsidies so that the federal government could get something out of it. I'd be happy to use. Just want to pick up, Mr. Curry. You said that they would be considered off-site. They would be physically on-site, as I understand it, but oh, considered yes. off-site? Yes. All right, so considered off-site didn't change their physical location. No, the They physical were there. They were an integral part of the site, but they were, it was illegal that they were considered off-site. Well, this is done often. You, you can have three or four floors of something or three floors of housing and then two floors of something else right. off-site. Yes, it's, it's I a... I, I think, I guess, I'd like us, this is one of the things, a minor thing, maybe we ought to change the phrase. Uh, I just, if something is on the site, we shouldn't call it off-site. We want to call it off-sides or something. I, I, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not off it's on the site. We shouldn't call it off-site. We'll find out some other way to do that. I appreciate that. Congress Frank, you're correct. I will not use the words off-site. I would say not considered in the mortgage. The, yeah. Okay, fine. But I must state at the time, I told him to consider it off-site. So I'm only stating what I said then. Then you reported back to Mr. Wilson? No, no, I you didn't. didn't. No, no, Mr. Wilson just made the contact. He I reported back to uh, Assistant Secretary FHA Commissioner, what's his name? Whoever was the Assistant Yes, whoever Secretary. was at the time. Okay. I only have one more question, Mr. Clerio. And I'm asking this uh, to give you an opportunity to set straight earlier testimony by others. Regarding previous testimony alleging your involvement in a fundraiser, did you ever ask anyone such as a developer doing HUD business for a contribution on behalf of Mr. Monticello or any other political official? Mr. Chairman, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Thank you very much, Mr. McClario. Congressman Shays. At this time, I'll pass. I'd like to reserve the right to question the witness. Congressman Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just announce uh, I've been working on an arrangement with Mr. Morrison, who had to absent himself because he's chairing an immigration subcommittee hearing. I'm the second ranking member of that. So after I've questioned Mr. DeClario, uh, and maybe we may have to vote, I won't be getting back because I'm going to go sit in for Mr. Morrison and chair the hearing because Mr. Morrison also wanted to participate in this. Mr. DeClario, I appreciate your testimony. I wanted to follow up on some of the questions that the chairman just ended on. Um, uh, you said that uh, you never solicited on behalf of, uh, of anybody. Because I, the particular issue I wanted to ask you about was the Jobco uh, selection in White Plains, I believe it was. As you know, there was a testimony before when Mr. Monticello testified that the city of White Plains got funds under the uh, modernization program, the Comprehensive Improvement Assistance Program. They solicited proposals. It wasn't strictly a dollar bid situation, as I understand it, but their choice was a firm. Um, they, they had their own choice of a firm, and uh, I guess it was for the Windbrook project. Polera Construction came in at the lowest bid. Our information from various sources was that White Plains was told by HUD that they couldn't have Polera, 
that, in effect, they had to hire JobCo. And the testimony I think we got was that they were told not that they had to hire JobCo, but that if they didn't hire JobCo, they wouldn't get the money, and they would have to rebid, which was a fairly coercive situation. Mr. Monticello, I believe, indicated that, well, I'm, I'm not clear whether Mr. Davis, now the Mr. Davis that we're talking about here is the one that you referred to earlier who uh, was Secretary Pierce's uh, choice for regional administrator, is that correct? Yes. All right. Well, the, the, the testimony wasn't clear, but <coughs> Mr. Davis and Mr. Monticello suggested that you were a major factor in the choice of JobCo over uh, Polera or anybody else. And I wonder if you would describe your relationships to uh, the various parties in that decision, what you knew about JobCo, uh, what role you played in the decision to reject uh, uh, Polera and to pick JobCo, if so, and what role you understood Mr. Monticello to be playing. With your permission, uh, my attorney and I prepared a statement on Winbrook. I would like oh. to read it. You're supposed to say you're glad I asked. <laughs> but go ahead. I am glad because when I listened to Mr. Monticello's testimony and your reaction to it, uh, yes, I'm very happy you asked. No, I appreciate it. When, when it was mentioned, Mr. Clare, and I, I may be part of the reason you're here, you were mentioned several times. It seemed to me elementary fairness that you'd be invited not as an accusatory matter, but to give you a chance to respond when you, you were, uh, whenever tough questions got asked, you somehow got nominated to be the person that got answered. Well, and it seemed I, that we ought to ask you what your role was. May I respond to that before I certainly. answer your question? Uh, I certainly did not take any objection to what you said. The objection I took to were two political appointees getting high grades. I started at $1,750 a year. Mr. Davis started at approximately sixty-five to 70000 a year. Uh, I'm not going to talk about his qualifications, but certainly he was not aware of what was going on in the technical aspects, but he certainly was aware that in 1982 that he received a memorandum signed by me, not prepared by me, uh, signed by me and prepared by the technical people, and he concurred to on November 3rd, 82, but he jumped to the opportunity to call a press conference. A memorandum about what, Mr. Curl? All right. May I read it? Yeah. I wrote to Edmund Davis, and he concurred to it on November 3rd, 82. Now, this, you must understand, is at a time when we had two offices, an area office and a regional office. Mr. Edmund Davis was the supreme being in the area office. And he acted that way. <laughs> it didn't violate the First Amendment of the Constitution? I didn't have a right to question him, and I don't know, sir. I wrote here, or signed the memorandum, prepare for me, Winbrook Federalization Construction. Man. Three of the four, I, uh, based on a technical reviews of the and Winbrook, just to be clear, is the modernization project in White Plains, which we were discussing with Jobco and everybody yes. else. Right. Go ahead. And of course, I had interest in the project because I'm a resident of the city of White Plains. And the White Plains are only inhabited by about 45,000 people. So I'm very familiar with what goes on at White Plains. Based on the technical reviews of the proposals submitted by the White Plains Housing Authority on the subject of project construction management contract, this office cannot concur in the authority selection of Polera. This firm does not have a record of multifamily housing experience. This fact is underlined by the inclusion of their proposal of a subcontract to a consultant with experience in these matters. Three of the four other proposals submitted show little or no multifamily housing experience. Jobco, however, has considerable experience in this field as developer, contract, and manager of multifamily projects. We therefore recommend a proposal as the most likely candidate to see in this project. This determination is made and supported by the attached memoranda from Joseph Scott of Chief Mortgage Credit, Marvin Stitch, Supervisory General Engineer, and Arthur Brenner, Chief Architect Course Branch. This was only a recommendation from me to Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis concurred, and he prepared a letter and expanded on it. Uh, later on, Marvin Stitch sent another memorandum to him. It was concurred to by three or four people, including myself, only concurring in the documentation, 
but Mr. Davis acted on it and prepared a letter to the White Plains Housing Authority. Now, I must add one other thing. In the apparent rejection of Palera, comments were made about someone he hired because he and his firm lacked the expertise. He hired a gentleman by the name of Romeo. Mr. Romeo did not meet the qualifications, not by my standards, but the standards of Arthur Brenner and also Marvin Stitch. But in addition, Robert Snipes, the president of the Tenants Council of the White Plains Housing, objected to him. So there was, there was reasons to So question. you're saying that the basis for the rejection of Pereira was the technical staff plus the, uh, plus the tenants. How about the, the, and the decision to select Jobco as the only qualified one, you say also was from the technical staff? Uh, this now, I will expand on your question. Uh, it appeared that he was the only qualified one, but I must add that I, as director of housing, dealing with the technical aspects, certainly felt a little encouragement by Mr. Davis, or even perhaps from the regional administrator, that the job go. The regional administrator being? Joseph Monticello. Well, what do you mean by you, Mr. Monticello encouraged you to pick Jobco? How so? What, uh... Well, at one time he stated that uh, uh, he felt that Jobco was the only qualified one. And I state this with a little thought because the housing authority at one time, when uh, Jobco wished to withdraw because of many problems, urged the regional administrator to intercede, and I think uh, Mr. Monticello met with the mayor of White Plains, and then it could have been at that time or maybe prior to the time. Uh, you got to understand. What, what could have been at that time or prior to the time? That he urged and told me that he wanted job go to get the job. Well, when the housing authority, did the housing authority want to get them out or keep them in? No. The you said the housing authority had raised some question when the there was... The housing authority wrote to HUD stating the intention of Jobco to withdraw from the contract. And, did, and what did they ask her to do about that? To intercede and beg them, I think to that stay. was their word. Pardon me? And, and the Housing Authority asked you to keep Jobco on the job? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so, I have the documentation. So your view is that there was no improper political influence exerted on behalf of Jobco? I Job did Co. not state that. I stated there was a feeling of their willingness to hopefully have Jobco be the ultimate... Uh, well, do you think there was some political influence being brought to bear based on considerations that should not, in the ideal sense, have influenced this choice? The answer is, in my opinion, knowing Palero, being a resident of White Plains, and knowing the other three uh, submissions, that there was no question that Jobco was the best qualified. No question in my mind. So it was not however, however yeah. I also feel there was some pressure. There was some political pressure on behalf of Jobco, but you say Jobco should have got it on the merits. If I had to make the determination uh, in a vacuum and reviewed all five, I would have chosen Jobco. Well, and, and where did the pressure come from? The only pressure I'm aware of uh, from Davis or Monticello. Either or or both? Tommy? They both put pressure on you for Jobco? I would say. I would say so. why, why would they have had that predisposition to Jobco in your judgment? Why? I don't know. Unless, uh, <laughs> well, you... Uh, if you don't know, don't, I don't, I'm not encouraging you to guess, Mr. Nicker. Well, I'm fairness well, to everybody. If you have some idea, you can tell us. If you don't, there's no, no need the, to... The word guess is uh, uh, something that you pull out of the air. When you work as director of housing, and when you worked for so many administrations from 1947 to 19, uh, whatever year I retired, 86, it's more than a guess, sir. Right. I have a feeling, and I survived the pressures of all politics. I knew there was some interest from Long Island to get Chapco. From Long Island? My attorney told me Senator D'Amato. <laughs> but you think that Senator D'Amato was favorable to Jobco, but you also believe that Jobco 
was the best of the applicants for the oh, job? There is no question in my mind that Jopko was the best. There's no question in my mind that the Senator D'Amato would have liked to have seen Jopko, but I don't, Senator D'Amato never spoke to me about Jopko, and I don't know if he spoke to anyone else, but I'm sure that Senator D'Amato was not unhappy about the thing. All right, I, no further questions. I, I, if they were the best people for the job, it seems to me that that's a uh, There was no question in my mind they were best qualified. Congressman Wise. Chairman, I have no questions. Congressman Wise. <laughs> you, you want to, Congressman Chase. Bruce will have some after the break. Uh, going back on this side. Uh, going back to your testimony. Okay, I just have one question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Going back to your testimony in which you gave Mr. Wilson $10,000 you testified that what you had heard was there was a problem with Hunter Cushing, um, that Mr. Wilson, and please stop me if I'm paraphrasing it improperly, uh, that Mr. Wilson came back to you and said that he, ha he would not interfere with the project. Um, did, uh, had, was this fee set in advance? No, there was no, I stated to Mr. Wilson that this was my first major endeavor and it was a substantial fee which uh, after working for 43 years with the United States government and uh, realizing the fee they were talking about I just did not want to, want to jeopardize it and I stated to Mr. Wilson that if he would help me and call them a co-sponsor that I would pay him 10000 He did not suggest the 10000 He did not ask for it. I st suggested it. In it, but before he made the calls? Oh, yes, I believe so. I, I believe the initial phone call. I told him how important it was to me and that uh, there would be a fee of 10000 as co-broker. Right. And that's he, what, when I send him the check, I have it listed in my file as co-broker. Did he give you any kind of a, uh, a, uh, a, a ledger or an account of hours spent, uh, uh, written... Uh, uh, statement of what he did? The answer is no. I didn't ask for it and I didn't get one. Mm -hmm. Did he indicate to you that Mr. Cushing had had a problem or did he just simply report back your that he will not interfere? He reported back to me stating after his discussion with Hunter Cushing that Mr. Hunter Cushing denied stating that he was holding me up for any reasons, which I expected him to say, and that if the processing proceeded uh, through the technical staff and up through his office that he would go on the recommendations of the technical people. Uh, to the best of my recollection, that is what Mr. Wilson stated to me. Did he offer, since it sounds, on the basis of what you've reported that he stated to you, it sounds like uh, uh, it's pretty cut and dried uh, in terms of being a fairly easily performed task uh, perhaps only a telephone call. Did he offer to give back any of the money? <laughs> Do I have to answer that? Let the record show the witness smiled. No, uh, the answer, he did not offer. Uh, but you, uh, let me state this. Mr. Wilson, uh, after his retirement, was the president of HDC in the city of New York, and they did a tremendous amount of work with HUD when I was there. And I found Mr. Wilson to be a friend, a nice person. And we had lunch on occasion. Uh, we had lunch. We had drinks. I think he paid for a lunch. I think it was 10 or $15. But he did not offer to return the $10,000. And I, I never expected it back. Did you feel that you got uh, uh, ample consideration uh, for what you'd asked him to do, that you'd gotten an ample work product? The alternative was being hurt politically because I was not of that political party. Yes, I feel that I received my fee, which was, which was substantially higher than $10,000. And did you genuinely believe that because you were not of the proper political party, that that was, uh, that was holding back your application? I feel that way, yes, sir. Did what, can you point to anything specific that gave, led you to that impression? The impression was that I knew that Hunt and Cushing uh, was appointed politically, and I think his previous position was 
as one of the assistants of Secretary Pierce upstairs, and then uh, as uh, political appointees are, and I'm sorry if I offend anyone, uh, it looks like the political appointees pick their positions, and uh, peop uh, positions are made for them. This and I feel that he felt he wanted to work as deputy assistant uh, secretary of housing, and that's where he was. In deference, Mr. Chairman, I think it's a worthwhile line, but I know Mr. Shays is waiting, and I'm. Uh, if if oh, are I, you going to wait until? If I, I may suggest, depending on how many more questions my friend from West one, Virginia, one more. Then, then if that's all right with my colleagues, we will conclude with Congressman Wise. Then we'll t take a break for the vote. Then we'll begin with Congressman Shays. Then Congressman Schumer. Since so it's please proceed. Okay. I think it's important. This second. Shoot that thing right there. Um, oh, that's, that's right. Um, I think it's important. Did anyone specifically say to you, your problem is, or give you the message, uh, your problem is you're not of the right political party or you've not supported the proper people? Excuse me, sir. I think I answered a question previously that after you work 43 years with the federal government, you get a feeling for what's going on. I certainly was aware that Hunter Cushing was a political person and that if you were of his party, things worked out nicely. And if they weren't, you had problems. But was and that when I went to Washington, Mr. Jim Hamannick, who holds a responsible position, was hurt by the fact that I was being hurt for reasons that he could not understand other than political reasons. But that came from your observations while working many years in the federal government, not from someone specifically saying to you. No, I will, re I will repeat you, my statement. You, well, well I, we've got your statement in the record. No, no, I think you missed the last part. My feelings after being there 43 years and substantiated by Mr. Hamannick's statement that uh, he was told without looking, Hunter Cushing, uh, without looking at the file, said what he said about me. All right. okay. Thank and, you very uh, all I can get from that is that uh, politically he didn't like me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it, we'll take a brief break and then we'll resume. Thank Subcommittee is in recess. You're watching Wednesday's session of the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing. C-SPAN will continue with this hearing in just a moment after we take a break to bring you program information. Good evening from Washington. We'd like to pause here for a moment to give you our program schedule for the evening, but first, this reminder. Join us here on C-SPAN on Sunday night for our regular series, Capital Agenda. We'll bring you a look.